If you want to open your Bibles and follow along, our scripture today is from Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 to 12, and it's entitled, Freedom in Christ. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the entire law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith, expressing itself through love. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Brothers and sisters, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his word. Good morning, everyone. Again, hopefully you can hear me uh, on the Facebook Live feed this morning. Is, it, is that good, Scott? Um, yes and no. Yes and no. <laughs> All right, well, let's pray for our Facebook Live listeners. How many of you are, are history buffs out here? If you like studying dates and events in history, I don't know if that was one of your favorite classes in school growing up. Uh, but if, if you are a history buff, what significant event in American history happened on January 1st, 1863? Anybody know? January 1st, 1863, this was the date that President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. The Emancipation Proclamation, that was a military order issued by the President that declared enslaved people in the Confederate states to be free. However, this proclamation was not delivered to everyone right away. It took a long time for every one of the slaves in the South to actually realize that they were free. Now, there's another date that in recent years our country has begun to recognize, June 19th. It was actually two years after the Emancipation Proclamation that federal troops traveled to Galveston, Texas to pass on the message that the Civil War had ended and that all the African American slaves should be freed. And today, that event is commemorated on Juneteenth, an annual recognition of the word finally getting out to the last remaining slaves that the war was over and that black people were now, I bring this up this morning because it reminds me of what was going on in the hearts of new believers in the ancient cities in the region of Galatia that were studying in this book. Paul had brought the message of the gospel to them, and it was a message of freedom. But after he left, after he planted those churches, he, he left them on their own, and there were these irritating Jews from Jerusalem that dogged him that followed him everywhere he went. And they told the Galatians that they not only needed to have faith in Jesus, but they also had to follow Jewish law. They needed to be circumcised and obey all the rules and rituals and holidays and festivals that the Jewish people observed. And the only problem was that wasn't a message of freedom anymore. It was slavery to Jewish legalism. 
So the very people that the gospel of grace had set free, they were now wavering. They were now being persuaded to accept a form of religious doctrine that Jesus Christ, by his death and resurrection, had proven to be obsolete. The Galatians were free, but some of them didn't know it. Some of them were deceived, they were bewitched, and they followed the teaching of the Judaizers, and they abandoned the path of freedom that Paul had brought to them and taught. And in this letter, the book of Galatians, that we've been studying, this is Paul's emancipation proclamation. It is Paul telling those that didn't realize that they were free that, yes, you are free. You don't need to be enslaved to a system of religious practices that Jesus declared is finished. It is finished, he said, from the cross. And what he meant by that is that the debt of sin had been paid, paid once and for all. And so that system of sacrifices and the priesthood and all of the blood that was shed with the animals that were sacrificed, all of the separation from God, that was over. Jesus was the final sacrificial lamb, and he opened the curtain that all may go in now. All people, Jews and Gentiles, now had access to God through Jesus Christ. That's a message of freedom. And that's why Paul begins chapter 5 of this book saying, It was for freedom that Christ set you free. Therefore, keep standing firm. And do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. That's the verse that starts chapter 5. Now, we've exited chapter 4, and we enter chapter 5 now, and Paul has effectively argued so far that the law is not the means to our salvation. In fact, it never accomplished that purpose, and it can never do so. And he used, remember last week we talked about Sarah and Hagar as an allegory. And Paul stressed that even if the law itself teaches God justifies through faith alone, you can't go back and turn that around and add anything to it. We ended chapter 4 last week teaching that we are children of Sarah, children who depend on God's promises, rather than children of Hagar who seek to be justified through works works of the flesh. And now we enter chapter 5. And Paul is reminding the church that any dependence on the law instead of grace for our righteousness, that's a no-win proposition. You can't win depending on the law to save you because the law is a system that demands perfect compliance, perfect obedience. And all we have to do is take one look in the mirror and we realize None of us are perfect. We don't measure up. And now as we move into the final two chapters, the last third of this book, Paul is going to turn in a new direction now. Uh, this new direction is explaining how Christian lives are under grace and not law. And Paul is going to detail for us what Christian liberty looks like. And since the law of Moses is no longer our guide for living, the question becomes, how should a Christian follow the Lord? While it's maybe easy to understand how grace has saved us from the penalty of sin, how does it preserve us from the reality of sin? If the law doesn't regulate our lives anymore, what does? So as Paul gets into this discussion, we see in our text today that he starts off talking about freedom and freedom in Christ. Again, verse 1, let's look at this. This is a key verse in the book. Uh, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. We talk a lot about freedom in America, don't we? That freedom is not just an American ideal, it's a biblical one. God desires us to be free from the constraints of religious duty and obligation. Our worship is not supposed to be an act of forced labor. The Lord desires our hearts to be free from slavery to sin. And so what does he do? He removes the yoke that binds us 
to Satan's schemes. And he fills us with the Holy Spirit. And it's through the Spirit's power that we actually have new desires planted in our hearts. We have the desire to be righteous and holy. And not only that, but the Spirit actually gives us the capability to overcome the sin that used to enslave us. Sin that we were once addicted to in the past. It's the Spirit that gives us that power to overcome. The Gospel is all about freedom. It's a biblical idea. But of course, there's always the struggle that we have against our flesh. Paul admitted to that himself. Read Romans chapter 7 sometime. Here's just a little portion of that. Paul says in Romans 7, starting in verse 18, For I know the good that good does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Can you relate to Paul's frustration with himself in these verses? I can. I'm well aware of my sinful nature. And it rears its ugly head far too often in my life. And I don't like that. Nevertheless, it keeps happening. Like Paul says, I have the desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. I stumble. I fall. The evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. So how do we get off of that track of slavery to sin onto the track of freedom from sin, which is the track of holiness and righteousness? The answer, in one word, is sanctification. Now, that's a big theological word. We talked about this a few weeks ago when we studied chapter 4. It's the process of being sanctified. It's a painful process. It's a long journey. It's an uphill battle. And if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you know the drill. You know, I try to do right, but I blow it, and I have to admit that I'm a sinner again. So I confess it to God, I seek forgiveness from Him and from others, and I have to swallow my pride and take on a new level of humility, but then I pick myself up, brush myself off, I start over again. You know what the Christian life is like? Have you ever been to the dunes? Hey, the Indiana dunes or the, the Michigan dunes? These are huge sand dunes all along the eastern shore of Lake Michigan, and if you've ever tried to climb up to the top of one of these hills, it's exhausting. First of all, if it's a hot day, the sand will literally <coughs> blister the soles of your feet, so there's that problem to contend with, but the, the climb is a lot steeper than it looks. And what makes it tough is that with every step, the sand beneath your feet slips downhill. So getting to the top takes twice as much effort. So for every step uphill, you're taking at least a half a step down. And you're trying to advance forward while you keep retreating a little bit backwards. Does your Christian life seem like that sometimes? The devil is always dragging us down. Sin is always a burden that limits our progress. Sin is always crouching at the door, waiting to pounce. And our human hearts have this amazing predisposition to return to sinful habits that we know are terrible for us. You know that verse in Proverbs? It's Proverbs 26, 11. As a dog returns to his own vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. This might make a good verse of the month sometime for our church. I might, I might just do that. What do you think? I couldn't resist uh, showing you this verse today, and I love the cartoon. You ever feel like that dog? Oh, man, I... I swear this is the last time. But yet I still want to taste it again. I want to sin, but I hate doing it. That battle between the flesh and the spirit describes all of us as believers. We all feel it. And it describes the Galatians, the Galatian people. In fact, Paul calls them fools. Chapter 3, verse 1. You foolish Galatians. We're all pretty foolish at times, aren't we? And I would call all of you fools, but I don't want to offend anybody, but that's just the truth. We're all foolish, myself included. 
and the enemy preys on our human weakness. Even when God is saving us out of slavery and sinful habits, there's always that pull or that tug to go back. And you can go back all the way to the first book of the Bible and see this pattern of human behavior. In Genesis chapter 19, we see a very graphic example of this. What happened in Genesis 19? Well, that's where the Lord destroyed the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and the only people that were saved from God's wrath were Lot and his family, his wife and two daughters. But what did Lot, uh, Lot's wife, what did she do? She looked back. They were told specifically by God's messenger angels not to look back, but Lot's wife didn't listen. She looked back, and what happened? She turned into a pillar of salt. Genesis 19. That event serves as a warning to us because we have a tendency to want to go back to our old ways, our former ways of thinking, our former ways of behaving. And even though we know it's going to lead to regret and spiritual regression, why do we do that? Why do we long to go back to our sin? Why can't we leave the pain and heartache of sinful ways in the past? It's because our human nature is depraved, and we've got a heart problem that can only be remedied by Jesus Christ, by His Spirit in us, helping us to daily walk away from our former ways of living, ways that now, as a born-again believer, we can clearly see we're selfish and not God-honoring. Getting back to the text here, Paul says, Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You've fallen away from grace. This part of the passage here, Paul is giving a warning. He says, mark my words. And he gives a warning about being led astray by false doctrine and false teaching. And he says, if you fall for it, Christ will be of no value to you. And what he means by that is if you accept the Judaizers' version of salvation, that you have to be circumcised and follow the Jewish law, then you're going to be obligated to live perfectly by it, without fault. And like I said earlier, that's a no-win situation. Nobody can live up to that standard. Nobody but Christ himself. So if that's the direction you're going, you've fallen away from grace. And grace is such an important concept to understand as a believer because it reminds us that God is the one who initiates and fully accomplishes salvation for us. We don't contribute anything to it. All we do is receive it with an open hand, by faith. Look at the next part of the text, verse 5. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. In this part of the passage, Paul emphasizes faith in both verses. He says in verse 5 that righteousness comes by faith. And in verse 6, he says that faith is the only thing that counts. So it's not the external, such as circumcision or uncircumcision. In other words, it's not about whether we perform any kind of religious duty, whether that's going to church or getting baptized or memorizing Bible verses or putting tons of money in the offering plate. That's not what saves you. The only thing that counts towards salvation is faith. It's faith. That's what Paul has been trying to emphasize in every part of this letter. And look at the next part of the text. Paul uses an illustration with an athletic theme. He says, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. Paul uses this comparison of faith to running a race. He does this a number of times in many of his letters found in the New Testament. Athletics and Olympic Games, those were a very popular thing in the ancient world, just like it is today. And he confirms that the Galatians were running very well at first. 
They started the race well. But someone cut in on them. Have you ever had that happen? Someone drifts into your lane. What does that cause you to do? You start to slow down or it trips you up. And who was responsible for cutting in on the Galatians? Well, it was the Jews from Jerusalem, of course. And I've mentioned them many times, the Judaizers. It was their influence that caused the Galatians to veer off from the truth of the gospel. You know, one of the most important things for Christians to pay attention to is what you're being taught. There are many different spiritual leaders these days, especially when we can turn on the TV or watch YouTube or a TikTok video. There's all kinds of books and other resources with biblical content. And we have to evaluate carefully what we're being taught because we have to decide if what we're listening to is truth or error. Because not all biblical content is biblical. So we have to ask, is it accurate? Is it doctrinally sound? Don't be misled. False teaching and false teachers are everywhere. It was around in Paul's day, and it's around today as well. And Paul gives some good advice here. The one who calls you, that's Jesus, he will never keep you from obeying the truth, which means you have to know the difference between the truth and falsehood. And Jesus will never persuade you to do anything that contradicts the truth found in God's word. So read your Bible. Know what it says and what it doesn't say. Because only then are you going to be able to recognize false teaching and identify false teachers. And one of the most common forms of false teaching is the one that plagued the Galatians. This idea that faith must be combined with works in order to be saved. Okay, you're familiar with the term hybrid? We hear it most often in reference to automobiles today. A hybrid automobile is one that runs on a combination of gas and electric energy. Well, there are false teachers that promote a hybrid faith. And what that is, is a combination of faith and works. Now, I remember years ago being at a, a Promise Keepers conference. It was a men's conference years ago, and there was a group of Christian protesters outside the event claiming that baptism was a necessary prerequisite, prerequisite for salvation. And they were passing out pamphlets, they were promoting their view, and it would have been easy to be confused by them and even persuaded until you consider that Baptism really is no different than circumcision in terms of its necessity for salvation. They're both external practices that actually can be performed without an ounce of genuine Christian faith. And as Hebrews 11.6 reminds us, without faith it's impossible to please God. Now let's look at the next couple of verses. Back to the text, Galatians 5. Verses 9 and 10 give us another warning to those who don't teach the scriptures accurately. He says, a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Yeast, or leaven, was used by Jesus quite often as an illustration of contamination. Just a little bit of yeast in a batch of dough has a way of contaminating the whole batch, which is a way of saying that all it takes is just a little bit of false teaching to create a whole lot of doubt and confusion and disunity in the church. Now, Paul was confident that the Galatians would not ultimately fall into the Judaizers' trap. He believed this based on how they first received the gospel. It was with great joy and enthusiasm, and they were flourishing in their faith while he was with them. But now that the Jews were there, they were throwing them into confusion, and he warned that those people would pay for their actions. And honestly, this is what scares the daylights out of me whenever I step into the pulpit. Because I know that I'm accountable for every word that I preach, and I'm not just talking about being accountable to the elders of the church. I'm talking about Almighty God. 
because I have to ultimately answer to him. So the last thing that I want to do up here is to mislead you or preach anything that isn't backed up by the scriptures. Because false teachers will pay dearly for the way their messages mislead the church when they misrepresent the gospel. It does harm to the kingdom of God. And unfortunately, many pastors and preachers do not take their job seriously. They handle the word of God carelessly. I don't ever want to be guilty of that. So please, hold my feet to the fire, because I know God is, but I need that from you as well. Finally, verses 11 and 12. Brothers and sisters, Paul says, if I am preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In the case, uh, in that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. And as for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Paul concludes this particular passage by stating the fact that he's being attacked and criticized for what he taught. And the attacks and criticism were coming from the Jews, of course. And he points out that none of that persecution would be occurring if he was preaching a hybrid religion of faith and works. But because he was teaching a pure religion of faith alone in Jesus, he was being denounced and condemned. And that's similar to what's happening in our world today. If you look at a lot of the big mega churches today, many of them do not teach a gospel that emphasizes sin and substitutionary atonement. The big churches don't talk about sin because they don't want to offend people, because offending people means less people attending and less money put in as donations. And so they don't talk about the cross as a means of God's wrath. Instead, they focus totally on the love of God and not his role as a judge. The offense of the cross in those cases is abolished. And so in order to promote a happy, loving, non-judgmental atmosphere, many churches fail to teach the full gospel message. Or they add to faith some extra requirements, such as good works or circumcision, and in Paul's case with the Galatians. And here in these verses, he uses a very graphic image when he says, for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. In other words, the agitators, the Jews, who were promoting circumcision, I wish, instead of them just cutting off a tiny piece of flesh, I wish they'd cut off the whole appendage. I mean, if righteousness is obtained from cutting off your foreskin, think about how much more righteous you would be if you just, you get the idea, if you would just completely mutilate yourself. That's a graphic word picture. And even though that's the last verse in our text today, I can't leave you with that image in your mind, so I'll say a few more things. Listen, if we add anything to the work of Christ, if we're saying that we don't believe his work was enough, do you believe what Jesus did on the cross was sufficient to save you? If you don't, if you're adding anything to it in any way, you're nullifying your belief in Christ because you're adding your own requirements. So many people have tried to roll their own formula of salvation, and they take a little bit of religion A and some of religion B, and they concoct their own recipe for salvation. But Paul says, if you add Christ to such a recipe, you might as well subtract Christ altogether because he's of no benefit under those circumstances. There is no point adding to a formula that's perfect already. Adding Christ to a formula that includes other steps or requirements, that's not a blessing, that's a curse. It's a curse because grace doesn't work that way. How many of you like to bake or cook? And when you do that, you use a recipe. Let's just say it's cookies. You know, you take your flour, your butter, eggs, sugar, whatever else you want in your recipe. But if you add anything to that that doesn't belong, like, I don't know, if you add pickles <laughs> or cheese, something that obviously doesn't belong in a cookie recipe, if you add that to your recipe, you're going to ruin the whole batch. 
you're never going to sell any cookies at that bake sale. So like leaven in a lump of dough, the church was introducing false teaching and it was polluting the entire body. And nevertheless, Paul says that he has hope for them that they might recover from these deceptions. And the main objection the Jews had to the message of the gospel was that salvation was available to the Gentiles without circumcision or law. But thank God that it is, that salvation is available to all who come to God in repentance and confess Jesus Christ as Lord. And you don't have to be a Jew. You don't have to be Catholic or Protestant or any of these other external categories of religious tradition. Those are outward expressions that don't matter because the Lord looks at your heart. And a heart full of sorrow and regret for sin, along with a heart full of faith in the saving power of the cross, that is what the Lord requires. Get it? Good. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would give boldness to me and to preachers in our land and all across the world to preach the gospel with purity and conviction. Lord, I pray that the message of saving faith would not just be a theological trend, but that the full implications of the gospel would take heart, would take hold in the hearts of preachers and teachers and believers everywhere. That they would proclaim the true gospel message with a holy boldness that would expose any hybrid misrepresentations of the gospel that come from the father of lies himself. And Lord, for those that are here with us today, may this be a day for salvation. As you bring some sinners all the way to Christ by faith alone, receiving him, confessing him as Savior and Lord. We pray that for your honor and glory. Amen.